Welcome back to our Earth Day presentation. Next up is Reverend Florence with our family story time. Hello friends. Welcome to Earth Day Circle Sanctuary. I'm so, so sad that we can't be together and be getting outside and into the greening grass and experiencing nature together. But we're all safe at home and we'll be together again soon. And in the meantime, I've got some of my favorite Earth Day storybooks that I'm really looking forward to sharing with you. Our first book is actually going to be really familiar for some of you all who were here with me at Imbolc, because this is actually the sequel to the book that we read Over and Under the Snow. This book is called Up and Up in the Garden, Down in the Dirt. And it's by Katie Messner with art by Christopher Silas Neal. And we're just going to dive right in to Up and Down in the Dirt. So, up in the garden, I stand and plan, my hands full of seeds and my head full of dreams. Yeah, that looked a lot like my garden a couple weeks ago. Snow and bare dirt. Spring sun shines down to melt the sleepy snow. Wind whistles through last year's plants and mud sucks at my rain boots. It's not quiet. It's not quite time, Nana says. Down in the dirt, things need to dry out and warm up. What's down there, I ask. You see below them, down in the dirt? We've got some, a couple little worms going. You can see the roots of the plant. Down in the dirt is a whole busy world of earthworms and insects, digging and building and stirring up the soil. They are already working down in the dirt. You see all those worms and snails and centipedes, creepy crawlies and ants and earwigs and ladybugs, all kinds of things down in the dirt. Up in the garden, we snap brittle stalks, scoop rusty armfuls, and wheel away weeds for the chickens. While they squabble and scratch, we spread compost over the soil. Do any of you have chickens at home? Chickens are awesome. Where I work, we had some chickens, but um, while we're closed, they had to go home with people who are taking care of them. Down in the dirt, pill bugs chew through last year's leaves. I give a gentle poke. They roll up tight and hide in plated suits of armor, roly-poly round. Took me forever. I thought their names were roly-polies when I was a little kid. Have you seen little roly-polies, little pill bugs? You see these little guys there? And how they roll up into balls when they get scared? <gasps> and what's that up there? A rabbit? That's good. Up in the garden, it's time to plant. I trail a furrow with my finger and sprinkle seeds in a careful row. Give them a drink, Nana says. We pat them down to snuggle in the dark. Down in the dirt, a tomato hornworm rests, waiting for wings and leaves where she'll lay her eggs. I'm not entirely sure that she'll be a welcome addition to the garden, but she's there, she's waiting. Now things are getting a little bit later. Up in the garden, carrot plants sprout, pea blossoms bloom, wasps are on the prowl, and honeybees visit, legs loaded with pollen. I saw some honeybees in my garden. Have you seen any honey honeybees yet this year? And look, look at those worms working underneath the little carrots, the little yellow carrots. I weed and wilt in the sun so strong, even Nana looks for shade. Down in the dirt, earthworms tunnel deep. I'm jealous of their cool, damp, dark. A lot going on in that dirt, even when it gets warm in summer. Up in the garden, rain shower! Nana turns the hose on me. Eee! You see that? They're playing with a hose. And look up in the tree. What's that in the nest? Little baby robins. Oh, and the... And the, looks like the daddy robin has got 
a little worm for the babies. Do you know how to tell the mommy robins from the daddy robins? So the, the boy robins, the male robins, have dark, dark black heads. And it's a, there's a very clear line between the black of their heads and the brown of their bodies. And the mommy robins, the female robins, the girl robins, they have let, um, their heads are still a little bit darker than their bodies, but not quite so dark. And it sort of goes from gradual lighter brown on the back to gradually sort of a more chocolate brown on the head. Now you know. I hide behind the cucumber vines, but their leaves can't save me. I shiver and laugh, drenched in Nana's rain. Down in the dirk, water soaks deep, roots drink it in, and a long-legged spider still walks over the streams. Yep. Spiders are great in the, in the garden. They'll help eat um, all the other bugs that we don't want in our gardens. Up in the garden, there's so much to eat. Ladybugs feast on aphids. Ladybugs are nice helper bugs. See all the little aphids there? Those little little pale um, yellow bugs? They're going to eat our plants if the ladybugs don't eat them first. Nana crunches green beans. I bite a rip toma ripe tomato warm from the sun. Juice dribbles down my chin. My daughter likes to do that. Sometimes when she helps me harvest tomatoes, only about half of them make it inside. Down in the dirt, a robin's beak finds a cricket, a beetle, a grub. Slugs are scrumptious too. All kinds of things eating down in the dirt. Up in the garden, we pick cukes and zucchini, harvesting into the dark. Bats swoop through the sunflowers, and I pluck June bugs from the basil until it's time for bed. Wow, look at that. You can see they're going home over the sky. And look, the bats. What are those bats eating? Bugs? Mosquitoes? Up in the garden, a praying mantis wakes to hunt mosquitoes. Nana sprays away the aphids. I'm after our grasshoppers. Ready to swoosh, but <gasps> snap, someone else is faster. Down in the dirt, a smooth, shining garter snake crunches on supper. See that snake? Yeah, that's a front that's a friendly snake. It's good, it's good. It's gonna eat some of the other pests and things that might nibble on our garden or um, nibble on the walls of our house. Snakes are good allies in the garden. Up in the garden, the wind grows cool. Pumpkins blush orange and sunflowers bow to September. Nana ties them together to build a house for reading. So she's pulled the sunflowers over. That's nice, aw. It's fun to spend time in the garden, even if you're not even tending the plants. Up in the garden, colored leaves litter the squash vines, and we know the cold is coming. Hurry, hurry, and harvest! There's time enough for neighbors, too! Down in the dirt, frantic ants gather what we leave behind. They're storing food for cooler days ahead. See all those little ants? And they're carrying food and other things that they found in the garden down into their nest. Everybody's got to get ready for winter. Up in the garden, Frost draws lace on leftover leaves where secret egg sacs hang, waiting for warm to return. We say goodbye and spread the winter blankets. Down in the dirt, beetles burrow, ants scurry home, earthworms curl tight in the dark. Didn't know that that was how earthworms slept. When Grandpa calls us in for soup, an autumn moon is rising. Up in the garden, dry corn stalks tremble and the wind smells like winter. But the long, ripe days of summer still rest in the garden beds. The ladybugs and bumblebees, earthworm and ants are hunkering down, hiding, biding their time. Dreaming of sunshine and blossoms and sprouts. Under the bare arms of trees and the blanketing snow, a whole new garden sleeps down 
in the dirt. Yeah. See how their, their little burrows and such almost look like flowers? Looks like plants and flowers, but what? Those are worms and, and beetles and seeds and eggs. It's wonderful. All those plants. Again, that was Up in the Garden, Down in the Dirt by Katie Messner with the art by Christopher Silas Neal. Hi there. Our next book is called Earth Mother by Ellen Jackson with illustrations by Leo and Diane Dillon. Check this one out at our local library just before it closed. And this is a book about Earth Mother and how everybody's got problems. Earth Mother awoke with the dawn. She fans sacred smoke in each of the four directions. Then she walks across the land singing a morning song. They're singing there and the birds are along with her. Earth Mother gave the beetles shiny jackets. She hung green acorns on the oaks. Bending low, she placed a piece of summer in flower seed. She turned her gaze to the sage-covered deserts and blew across the mesas. A hawk cupped the warm air with its wings. Man greeted Earth Mother as she walked beside the river. He held a net in his hands to catch frogs for his breakfast. You are kind to me, Earth Mother, said Man. You have sent frog to fill my belly, and I am grateful. Look, at, he's given her a compliment. Oh, and she's got frogs on her, oh, on her mantle there. That's really lovely. Man slapped at his face. Ouch! But why have you sent this wretched mosquito to torment me, to sting me at night and drive me from my bed, he asked. Mosquito is bad, bad, bad. Frog, on the other hand, is sweet, tasty, and oh, so wonderfully delicious. But if there were more frogs and no mosquitoes, none at all, this world would be perfect. He's got some ideas. Man went back to the business of hunting frogs. Earth Mother walked on. She's like, mm, I'll take that under advisement. Earth Mother walked across the African savanna wearing a robe fringed with falling rain. She filled the water holes and sharpened the thorn bushes. Her hand guided the sunbird to a blossom sweet with nectar. See right there? She climbed a peak and flung a spear of lightning into the sky. The mountain felt the sting and fury of her storm. In the north, Earth Mother powdered the trees with snow. Tiny crystals gleamed in the air like diamond dust. In the late afternoon, Earth Mother heard frog calling. Frog sat in a log near the lake. With a flick of his tongue, he caught a small insect and swallowed it whole. Thank you, Earth Mother, said Frog. Mosquito and her sisters fill my belly and give me life. But why have you sent man to catch and eat me? Man is bad, bad, bad. Sweet, delicious mosquito, on the other hand, makes me happy. If there were more mosquitoes and no men, this world would be perfect. And she's got... Look what is on her mantle this time. It's got mosquitoes on her mantle as Frog is complaining to her. Earth Mother smiled and walked on. In the evening, Earth Mother dived with the whales into the depths of the ocean. Blue-green light trailed from her fingertips. She's got a lot to do in a day. A silver moon rose on the horizon. Earth Mother cradled an otter in a tangle of seaweed, rocking him on the waves. It was nighttime. As Earth Mother walked through the meadow, she heard a tiny voice. Earth Mother, Earth Mother, it is I, Mosquito, 
said the owner of the voice. Frog will surely feast on me tomorrow or the next day. He's already caught most of my sisters. But I am grateful for man who lives by the river. He is tender and delicious when I bite him in his bed. What is needed is more men and none of these useless frogs. Then this world would be perfect. Do you see what's on her dress this time? Looks like men, people. Earth Mother sighed. <sighs> Once more, she walked on. Earth Mother climbed the hill to her cloud teepee. She spangled a tree with fireflies. She spread spider webs lace on the grass. She's had a big day. Earth Mother said good night to the beetles, to the hawks, to the people, to the sunbirds, to the frogs, to the whales, to the otters, to the mosquitoes, to the fireflies, to her children everywhere. Then she went to sleep, and the world, in its own way, was perfect. Does that give you a little bit of perspective? Do you make you think maybe, you know, when we're like, oh, those mosquitoes, the frog's like, yes, mosquitoes are great. And we might not eat a lot of frogs here in Wisconsin, but they're an important source of food in a lot of other places. So it just makes you think about the whole cycle and how we're all interdependent. And maybe, you know, sometimes Earth Mother's a little bit wiser than we are. What do you think? Hi, our next book is a real favorite of mine. I got it at the library and it combines a little bit of animism or the idea that things that normally don't have personalities and talk to us, like the sun, can do so with science. So I think that's a brilliant combination and that's why I'm very glad to bring you Living Sunlight, How Plants Bring the Earth to Life by Molly Bangs and Pre Penny Chrisholm. It's a gorgeous book. So let's dive in to Living Sunlight. Listen to me, do this one thing. Lay your hand over your heart. Go ahead, you can do it. Put your hand right here, just like the kid in the picture. Lay your hand over your heart and feel. Feel your heart pump, pump, and pump. Feel how warm you are. This is my light, alive inside of you. I am your sun, your golden star. I burn. My light energy explodes in all directions. Most fade into endless space, but some tiny, tiny, tiny part of my light falls on your small planet. You know what that planet's called? Earth. So you see, the sun's so big, and there we are. Our tiny, 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 tiny earth. So small. I warm your land and seas, melt your glaciers, create your winds. I do all of this, but I do far, far more. My light becomes the energy for all life on earth. All living things, including you pulse with my light and keep it circling round and round on earth. How do living things do this? What's your secret? Your secret starts in plants, green plants. Plants suck up water, H2O, from earth. H2O is another word for for water. We'll get into that. In daylight, green plants catch my energy with their chlorophyll. That's the things that are in their leaves that make them green. And then, zap! Plants use my energy to break apart the water, break the H2O 
into H and O2, hydrogen and oxygen. But as plants break apart the water, they trap my energy in little packets. So we can kind of see that. So here's the water and there's the, um, the roots sucking up the water and here's the chlorophyll taking in all these little lights and putting them in and storing them. And then they break it apart. That water comes in, it's broken into hydrogen and oxygen. And the plant stores all of that light energy. Meanwhile, plants are breathing. Yes, plants breathe. They breathe out the oxygen they broke off from the water and they breathe in carbon dioxide, CO2, from the air. Now, plants use the packets of my energy and the carbon dioxide from the air to build sugar. Who here likes sugar? Okay, we all do in various forms. So plants make sugar. And with this sugar, plants build all their parts, all the leaves and stems and juices, all the seeds and fruits and flower of all the plants on earth are built with sugar made from air and water using my light energy. This is called photosynthesis, making life with sunlight, my light. This is my gift of energy to you. Sun seems really happy about all this. I love that. But wait, you're not green. You have no leaves, no chlorophyll. You cannot catch my light and neither can your parents or your friends or your teachers or any reptile, insect, fish, bird, or mammal in the whole wide world. How do you get energy? Do you know? How do you get energy? When your mom or your dad or your grandparents, or your teacher says, hey, eat up so you'll have some energy? Uh-huh. Yes, you eat plants. And, all the, and other animals eat plants too, and sometimes we eat other animals. When you eat plants, leaves and stems and juices, when you eat their seeds and fruits and flowers, you eat my energy, my living light. So all of those plants that feed us and feed the animals that make our milk or eggs or other things, that all comes from energy from the sun. Look, we've got all those things. What do we see here? We've got a horse eating an apple. It looks like an opossum too. Ah! And this cow is eating the kale and this girl's like, no, don't eat my kale. I need to eat that. We've got skunks and fox and people and frogs, rats. Oh, everybody loves plants. And plants do even more than give you food. Remember how in photosynthesis, green plants breathe out oxygen? What happens to that oxygen? It fills the air. All the oxygen you living creatures breathe comes from the green plants. Take a deep breath. All of that, everything coming into your lungs, nourishing you, that came from plants, which came from the sun. Breathe in. Feel the oxygen flow into your nose, your mouth, all through your body. Oxygen is a gift from the plants to you. Your body uses oxygen together with the sugars from the plants. Your body burns them slowly to make the energy you use to move and grow and live. Without plants, you would have no oxygen. Without plants, you would have no food. Without plants, you could not live. Without plants, there would be no life on earth. Pretty awful. Now, breathe out. <sighs> it's not oxygen that you exhale. When you use the sugars from the plants for energy, the sugars break apart inside your body, changing back into water and carbon dioxide. So you breathe out carbon dioxide and the plants breathe it all in. They will use it to build more sugar, food for themselves and other living things. So you see, life keeps circling around, round, round on your planet Earth, through photosynthesis and through yourselves. You share life with everything alive. Love this picture. Look at that big circle that we're all a part of.
Lay your hand over your heart and feel. Feel my light inside of you. You hold my light and make it live. You are living sunlight. Isn't that a wonderful message? You are living sunlight. And that book again is Living Sunlight by Molly Bang and Penny Krisham. Hi there. Our next book is The Little Green Head. Now, some of you may have heard of the story of the little red hen who had a bit of trouble getting anybody else to help her with some bread. Well, this is the story of the little green hen and it's got a slightly different message. The Little Green Hen by Allison Murray. Once on the top of the hill grew a beautiful old and very fruitful apple tree. And in the hollow of his trunk lived a little green hen. See her in there, peeking out? The little green hen looked after the apple tree. She pruned dead branches. See, there she is, chipping them off with her beak. She kept pests under control. Hey, you, get out of there. And she sowed the apple seeds so more apple trees would grow. We're going to not necessarily go into that, but there's a picture of the process. But as weeks went by and the seeds that she'd planted began to grow, the little green hen realized that she needed some help to look after her new orchard. Bug looks like it wants to help. me tend the apple trees asked the little green head the, br the branches need pruning not i said the peacock he was far too busy preening himself i will said the dog who loves sticks who will help me keep the pesky bugs from eating all the leaves asked the little green hen not i said the fox who was much more interested in eating the little green hen i will said the teensy brown sparrow who was partial to pesky bugs and who will help me sow the apple seeds? Not I, said the fat ginger cat, who was far too busy lounging on a log in the sun. I will, said the squirrel, who was very good at burying things where no one could find them. So the new friends helped the little green hen tend the orchard, and the orchard shared its bounty with them through the spring. Look, all these blossoms happening. Summer and fall. What happens in an orchard in the fall? That's right, apples. Then down came the rain. It rained for days and weeks and more. The new friends stayed dry and warm in the old apple tree. But Peacock couldn't stay in his hydrangea bush. The pond was overflowing. And Fox couldn't stay in his den, which was filling up with water. Luckily, there was just enough room for all of them on Cat's log. Look, the water's getting deeper and deeper and deeper. Oh no, it's a flood. The log which drifted away across the flood water. See them? Oh dear. Until... Look! It's the old apple tree! cried Cat. Maybe the little green hen will help us. Quick! Paddle! So they're all paddling over towards the apple tree on the crest of the hill. It was crowded inside the old apple tree, but the little green hen welcomed the newcomers warmly. Together, they waited for the rain to stop. They're like, can we come in? And the little green hen's like, yes, sure. There's room for everyone. Now you're a little bit late to the party, better late than never. Eventually, the sun came out and the floodwaters began to disappear. The little green hen stepped out of the apple tree. Who will help me clean up this mess? She said to no one in particular. We will, said dog and squirrel and sparrow. 
And so will we, said Fox and Cat and Peacock. The little green hen had never had so many enthusiastic helpers. I think they may have learned their lesson. Time passed and the seedlings grew into a beautiful orchard. The rain still came, but the thirsty young tree roots soaked up the water and floods were rare. Little Green Hen and her friends looked after the orchard and the orchard looked after them. The food and shelter it provided were more than enough. See? For everyone. New tree and new little baby chicks for Little Green Hen. The end. So that's a little bit of a different message for Earth Day, a little bit of a different story. It's about the value of working hard to care for our planet, and also the value of reaching out to those who didn't quite get the message as quickly as we would like. All right, it wouldn't be Earth Day if we didn't read one of the classic stor um, stories about Earth and a planet and our responsibilities from 1971, The Lorax by Dr. Seuss. Grown-ups, I know a bunch of you want to see this, too. At the far end of town where the grickle grass grows and the wind smells slow and sour when it blows and no birds ever sing, excepting old crows, is the street of the lifted Lorax. And deep in the grickle grass, some people say, if you look deep enough, you can still see today where the Lorax once stood just as long as it could before somebody lifted the Lorax away. What was the Lorax? Why was it there? And why was it lifted and taken somewhere from the far end of town where the grickle grass grows? The old Munzler still lives here. Ask him, he knows. You won't see the Munzler. Don't knock at his door. He stays in his lurkum on top of his store. He lurks in his lurkum, cold under the roof where he makes his own clothes out of myth mutter moof. And on special dank midnights in August, he peeks out the shutters and sometimes he speaks and tells how the Lorax is lifted away. He'll tell you perhaps if you're willing to pay. On the end of a rope, he lets down a tin pail and you have to toss in 15 cents and a nail in the shell of a great, great, great grandfather snail. Then he pulls up the pail, makes a most careful count to see if you've paid him the proper amount. Then he grunts, <clears throat> well, go. Oh. Then he hides what you've paid him away in his snub, in his secret strange hole, in his grevulous glove. Then he grunts, I will call you by my whisper phone, for the secrets I tell are for your ears alone. So down slops the whisper phone to your ear, and the old Wensler's whispers are not very clear, since they have to come down through a snurgly hose, and he sounds as if he had smallish bee up his nose. Now I'll tell you, he says, with his teeth sounding gray, how the Lorax got lifted and taken away. It started way back, such a long, long time back. Way back in the days where the grass was still green and the pond was still wet and the clouds were still clean and the song of the swami swans rang out into space. One morning I came to this glorious place and I first saw the trees, the truffula trees, the bright colored tufts of the truffula trees, mile after mile in the fresh morning breeze. But those trees, those trees, those truffula trees, all my life I've been searching for trees such as these. The touch of their tufts was much softer than silk, and they had the sweet smell of fresh butterfly milk. I felt a great leaping of joy in my heart. I knew just what to do. I unloaded my cart. In no time at all, I built a small shop. Then I chopped down a truffula tree with one chop. And with great skillful skill and with great speedy speed, I took the soft tuft and I knitted a sneed. The instant I'd finished, I heard a gazump. I looked. I saw something pop out of the stump. The tree had dropped down. It was 
sort of a man. Describe him, that's hard. I don't know if I can. He was shortish and oldish and brownish and mossy, and he spoke with a voice that was sharpish and bossy. Mister, he said with a sawdusty sneeze, <laughs> I am the Lorax. I speak for the trees. I speak for the trees, for the trees have no tongues, and I'm asking you, sir, at the top of my lungs, he was very upset as he shouted and puffed, what's that thing you've made out of my trivula tuft? Look, Lorax, I said, there's no cause for alarm. I chopped just one tree. I am doing no harm. I'm being very useful. This thing is a th need. A th needs a find something that all people need. It's a shirt. It's a sock. It's a glove. It's a hat. But it has other uses. Yes, far beyond that. You can use it for carpets, for pillows, for sheets, or curtains, or covers for bicycle seats. The Lorax said, Sir, you are crazy with greed. There's no one on earth that would buy that fool's need. I repeat, cried the Lorax. I speak for the trees. I'm busy, I told him. Shut up, if you please. I rushed across the room, and in no time at all, I built a radio phone, and I put in a quick call. I called my brothers and uncles and aunts and I said, listen here, here's a wonderful chance for the whole Wunzler family to get mighty rich. Get over right here fast, take the road to North Niche, turn left at Weehawken, shop right at South Stitch. Those could totally be places in Wisconsin. Then, oh baby, oh baby, how my business did grow. Now chopping one tree at a time was too slow. So I invented my super axe hacker, which whacked off four trefula trees with one smacker. We were making these four times as fast as before. And that Lorax, <laughs> he didn't show up anymore. But the next week he knocked at my new office door. He snapped. <laughs> I am the Lorisk who speak for the trees, which you seem to be chopping as fast as you please. But I'm also in charge of the brown barbaloots, who played in the shade in their barbaloot suits and happily lived eating truffula fruits. Now, thanks to your hacking my trees to the ground, that's not enough truffula fruit to go around, and my poor barbaloots are getting the crummies because they have gas and no food in their tummies. They loved living here but I can't let them stay. They'll have to find food and I hope that they may. Good luck, boys, he cried, and he sent them away. I, the Wunzler, felt sad, but as I watched them all go, but business is business and business must grow, regardless of crummies and tummies, you know. I meant no harm, I most truly really did not, but I had to grow bigger, so bigger I got. I'd biggered my factory, I'd biggered my roads, I'd biggered my wagons, I'd biggered their loads of the thneeds I shipped out. I was shipping them forth to the south, to the east, the west, to the north. I went right on biggering, selling more thneeds, and I biggered my money, which everyone needs. Then again he came back. I was fixing some pipes, when that old nuisance Lorax came back with more gripes. <coughs> I am the Lorax, he cluffed and he whiffed. He sneezed and he snuffled, he snarkled, he sniffed. One slur, he cried with a cluff for the stroke. One slur, you are making such smogulous smoke. My poor swami swans, what? They can't sing a note. No one can sing who's got smog in their throat. Oops. And so, said the Lorax, please pardon my cough. <coughs> They cannot live here, so I'm sending them off. Where will they go? I don't hopefully know. They may have to fly for a month or a year to escape from the smog you've smogged up around here. You're glumping the pond where the hummingfish hum. No more that can they hum for their gills are all gum. So I'm sending them off while their future is deary. They'll walk on their fins and get woefully weary in search of some water that isn't so smeary. Then I got mad. I got terribly mad. I yelled at the Lorax. Now listen here, Dad. All you do is yap, yap, and say, bad, bad, bad. Well, I have my rights, sir, and I'm telling you, I intend to go on doing just what I do. And for your information, you Lorax, I'm figuring on biggering and biggering and biggering 
and biggering and turning more Trevula trees into needs, which everyone, everyone, everyone needs. And at that very moment, we heard a loud whack. From outside in the fields came a sickening smack of an ax in a tree, and we heard the tree fall, the very last truffula tree of them all. No more trees, no more sneeds, no more work to be done. So in no time, my uncles and aunts, everyone, all waved good me goodbye. They jumped in their cars and drove away under the smog smuggered sky. And as all that's left neath the bad smelling sky is my big empty flactory, the Lorax and I. The Lorax said nothing, just gave me a glance, just gave me a very sad, sad backward glance as he lifted him up himself by the seat of his pants. And I'll never forget the grim look on his face when he heisted himself and took leave of this place through a hole in the smog without leaving a trace. And all that the Lorax left here in this mess was a small pile of rocks with the one word, unless. Whatever that means, well, I just couldn't guess. That was long, long ago, but each day since that day, I've sat here and worried and worried away. Through the years when my buildings have fallen apart, I've worried about it with all of my heart. But now, said the Wensler, now that you're here, the word of the Lorax seems perfectly clear. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better. It's not. So, catch, calls the Wensler. He lets something fall. It's a truffula seed. It's the last one of all. You are in charge of the last of the truffula seeds. And truffula trees are what everyone needs. Plant a new truffula. Treat it with care. Give it clean water and feed it fresh air. Grow a forest, protected from axes that hack. Then the Lorax and all of his friends may come back. That's the Lorax by Dr. Seuss. It's got good messages for all of us. Thank you so much for joining me for this story time. I'm so glad to share it with you, and I can't wait till we can be back in person. Thanks, Lawrence, for that presentation. I hope all the kids at home and families enjoyed that. Um, next up is Reverend Dennis with our Eco Psychology, and that's going to be at 12.30 p.m. So this is kind of our lunch break. Go ahead and grab something for lunch or bring your food and come back, and uh, Reverend Dennis is going to get us started again at 12.30.